<laughs> okay, so in comparison to, to week five and six, I guess this isn't that bad. So, um, you only need to do a few things this week. Basically, you need to use something that's called the find function. Um, that's, I guess, a conditional operator. And then later on, you need to be able to plot these piecewise functions, um, basically using an extension of that conditional operator. Um, so, what that essentially is, it allows you to use what's called in computer science a boolean variable. And that's a variable that can have um, two values, either true or false. And the way the computer stores this information is, it has a 1 for true and a 0 for false. And we'll actually see how this um, is important later on when we do the piecewise functions. But for now, uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. So the first um, exercise you're given actually comes from the MATLAB textbook. And basically, you're given a chart with times and temperatures. And your first task is to use the find function to sort through this matrix and find the temperatures that exceed the maximum allowable temperature, which in this case is 105 um, degrees Fahrenheit. So basically, you want to find, I guess, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and then later on, um, well, 21 o'clock and 20 o'clock. So those are the five values that exceed 105, but you want to be able to find that using the find function. Uh, so the first thing is, alright, this is basically, I just set this up because you wouldn't want to watch me enter numbers for like three minutes. But um, over here we have one vector of the times, um, and those are military times, so they just go from, I guess, 1 to 24, and we have the temperatures, which I had to enter in manually. So I guess we can make one big matrix out of those by um, combining them together and, of course, transposing vectors so that you get a column, I guess, like this. So we have the values stretching from, I guess, 0 hours to 24 hours and each of the temperatures at those points. Um, the next thing you want to do is probably either look in the notes here for how this find function works. Um, and there's some examples here, but they're not particularly useful. It's probably easier just to do what you usually do, read the documentation instead. So there's various, I guess, things you could do with the function. Um, in this case, we have this big capital R X, and that's supposed to represent a matrix that we're going to forward to the function. And when we put that matrix in, um, typically in our find, we want to put some sort of condition. So basically, um, well, I guess it's easier to explain by just doing it. So we want to find values within the matrix chart that exceed 105. And the output values we get are the indices um, in that in that matrix. So. One thing that's probably coming to mind is, well, this is a two-dimensional. How are we getting indices that are just that? Shouldn't we get two different numbers? Um, well, what actually happens is probably a reshaping of the matrix when it's soaring through these values. Um, but you don't really need to worry about that that much. Because um, that already tells you, I guess, indices that are of interest. So all you need to do is take these indices, um, apply them to the chart, and you're going to get the values that exceed 105, and these values down here are the values that exceed 105. Furthermore, I believe what we want to do next is use the length function to find the number of values that exceed 105. And that's simply going to be the number of elements um, that we find using the find function. So here we have an I for index, um, and we have five indices that we found. So there's going to be five values that exceeded 105. And when you use the length function, that's exactly what you get, the number five. So 
the problem goes on to, I guess, repeat the same exercise using a minimum temperature. So you want to find temperatures that are below 102. Um, and that's essentially you're going to do the same thing. So instead of I, I'll use J this time. We'll look through chart and we'll look for values that are less than 102. And there's quite a few values that are less than 102. Um, and we apply that those indices to chart, we'll see what those values are. Um, and here, you have to be a bit more careful because it's actually taking those um, hour values as well. So you see how we have that 0 through 24 is the hours, it's not discriminating between temperatures and hours. Um, so there's various things you can do to account for that. We know that our temperature ranges are pretty much above 99 and our hours are between 0 and 24. So if we specify that the chart values we're looking for have to be greater than 24, um, we can cut those hours out and we'll only get temperatures. Um, so that's one way of doing it. There's multiple ways if, you, if you're clever enough. Um, so what I should specify here is you have something that's called a, a compound conditional, I guess. You use this AND to link the two conditions together. So you have one condition here and another condition here. So you're only looking for values that satisfy both of these conditions. If you wanted to do OR, you would use this, I guess, vertical bar character instead, but AND, you're just going to use the ampersand. So the last thing that this problem wants you to do is it wants you to find values that are between 102 and between 105 and that's essentially doing the same thing that we just did um, using the compound I guess conditions. So we want values that are greater than 102 from our matrix chart and we want values that are uh, less than 105. So okay we'll give us the indices that satisfy those conditions. And then if we take those indices and plug them back in the chart, uh, we get exactly what we want. And those are the values that are valid. And then if we want the number of values that are valid, we're simply going to take the length of that vector, and it's going to be 9. Um, okay, that's essentially most of exercise 1. The only thing else it wants is to find the maximum temperature. Um, that's easy. You're just going to use the max function on chart. And, um, again, when you're using max, you're going to have to be careful and actually look at the documentation. As you can see here, it gives us two values. Um, and what it's doing is it's finding the maximum in each column. Since there are two columns, it's finding 24 as the maximum hour and 107 as the maximum uh, temperature. So if you want to get the indices, you're going to have to use another find function. But again, that's, that's not much of a step past what we've already done. Um, if you're using, I guess, a more complicated or less user-friendly um, language than MATLAB, you would actually have to use for loops to iterate through this array to find the values. But you guys haven't seen for loops yet, so you'll probably actually get to do that in a week or two. But I believe from the MATLAB textbook, um, he wants you to do problem 8.3. That's essentially uh, the same thing. So I'll actually just leave that for you to do as practice. It's just a bigger array. Um, you just have to be slightly more careful with the find function, but it's nothing, nothing too different. Um, but 8.2 is slightly more interesting. So we'll take a take a look at that. So when we're given a height function with these values. So I guess I'll enter that in. Again, you want to do these exercises in different cells and have it clear in the CLC so that variables from here don't carry over because we're probably going to use I, J, K again. So you want to clear those variables and you also want to clear the command line just in case you get any errors. You're not going to want to see those again. So what are we doing? Okay, so we have this height function. And um, whenever you have higher powers, you guys already know you got to use this dot operator. Um, otherwise, it will be an ill-defined operation, or it will get some weird values if it is a well-defined relation. Um, this last value, hopefully I'll get it right. See the 4.6. Probably gonna 
say T is not fine. Alright, yeah, T is not fine. Okay, so on the problem it tells you to find T from 0 to 100 using two second intervals. Uh, you should be very comfortable with that by now. Alright, so now height is well defined. Um, I guess even if it doesn't ask us to do it, we can plot and see what it looks like. So, this is the graph so far. As you can see from the recitation page, he wants you to eventually truncate the graph to look like this. Um, and the problem kind of guides you on how to do that. So first, it asks you to find when the rocket hits the ground. So, as you can see from the graph, um, if the height of the rocket is negative, that means it has gone past the bottom of the ground, and it's, it's, it's below ground at that point. So, the condition we're going to use for the find function is simply we're going to find in our height vector values that are negative. So that'll return the indices um, in the height vector that are negative. So if we want to find the time, um, what we're simply going to do is apply these indices to t. And you'll see that after 64 seconds, that's when our height first dips below the ground. So we'll keep that um, stored as some sort of variable, I guess. Um, below ground, we'll store it as that. Okay, so that tells us the time that the rocket hits the ground. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is use max to find the maximum height of the rocket. Um, again, that's easy, especially since this is a vector, we don't have to worry about getting multiple values. It's simply going to tell us the maximum height and pull it directly from that vector. And that height's going to be that. Um, we're probably going to want the time that it occurs at later, because you can see from the graph that eventually he has that point there in a red circle. So I'm simply going to um, use this find, I guess. In this case, we want the height to be equal to. Um, you're going to use the double equal sign because it's a conditional statement. Um, and that's going to get the indice um, in the height vector that you find the maximum. And we want to use that indice in the time to find the time that it occurs at. And that time looks to be 40 seconds. So we're going to store that as um, time. Okay, um, we could even try, I guess, plotting that, so we would use time max and the height at time max, and let's make that a red dot. And let's see what it looks like. Okay, that's not so great. Oh, well yeah, instead of... So, one thing you have to keep in mind is that the indice uh, is going to be different from the actual value of the time. So we can just use the max value we found. Um, so, how about max height? That should work. Yeah, so there we go. Now we're up there. Okay. So, what else do we want to do? We want to plot this, but we want to cut out the part that is below ground. Okay. So this gets a little more complicated, but not much so. And what you have to worry about is when using the plot function, your x values and your y values for the vectors need to be the same uh, length. If they're not, it won't it won't plot it because some points won't be well defined. So first, you need to find times um, where the rocket is above the ground. Um, and since we have already this below ground value, we know that when the time is less than 64, it will be above ground. So let's redefine t to be um, find t that is less than 64. And we'll get, well, yeah, we'll, we'll get the plot later. We should get an error for that. We're going to find 32 values of time that are um, less than 64, because remember we're working with two second intervals, so if you want the actual times, you're going to have to double that. 
will account for that later, though. Okay. Oh, the other thing we're going to want is we're going to want the heights where, um, types that are positive. We're going to want to redefine the height vector to consider only those. So we want to find in height the values that are greater than zero. On uh, here is where you have to be careful because from the times we got 32 values, but for the heights we got 31 values. Um, so here if you add in that equals you find the, the point where it actually hits the ground and you should include that as well so that your vectors have the same length. Um, now since we've redefined the time and the height or the x and y values to have the correct size we should just be able to graph it and it'll work out fine like that. Okay that's not what it's supposed to look like. Um, and that's because again these values we got here these are indices so we need to make sure that Once you input the indices, you'll actually get the values in the x vector and the y vector that work. And you'll be able to plot those. Um, I believe the problem also wants you to put the zero down there, but um, again, that isn't much, much more. So I'm actually going to leave that as an exercise for you guys. So the last thing that you need to figure out is how to do this piecewise function and get the graph um, basically to look like this over here. I guess it's kind of rocket looking thing. So the way that um, piecewise functions work is that, well they're pretty easy and you'll really luck out if you get a piecewise function on your exam because all you need to remember is basically the form of how to do it. So you're going to make an anonymous function declaration um, using the function handle and all you need to do is verbatim take each of the values from um, the piecewise function you're given, and you need to include the conditional. So here we have the function being zero if x is negative or if x is less than zero. Um, so we need that piece. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it like that for now. Those of you that know what's happening, um, just chill out for a sec. Okay, so the complicated part of that, of, of this piecewise function, is actually understanding what the computer is doing. So for each of the, I guess, partial functions you have over here, on the left hand side in this column over here, you want to, I guess, keep the parentheses around those because um, there are going to be groups that are multiplied by this, and this statement over here is a condition. So like I was saying before, um, if you have these relational operators, um, which are the greater than signs, the less than signs, and the equal signs. Those basically return um, a boolean, which is either true or false, corresponding to one or zero. So we're going to make a bunch of x values, um, and they're going to be, say, between, I believe it even says, they're going to be between negative one and five. So what's going to happen is, well, I guess I'll make them first. So negative one use a step size of 0.01 and have it go to 5. So we have all these x values that we're going to throw into this function and they're going to return different uh, values from these conditionals. So if we're using negative 1 for instance, we know that negative 1 is less than 0. So this conditional um, will be evaluated as true, which means the computer will represent it as a 1. Which means it will basically multiply this by this. Uh, for that reason, you're almost going to need a dot there because you're um, multiplying a vector of ones and zeros, or one, well, distinctly ones or zeros, by values of the function. Similarly, over here, um, we're looking at values that are between uh, zero and one. So you're going to have to use that compound conditional. Um, so x is greater than or equal to zero, and x is less than one. And the reason why you have this plus sign is you're taking all these partial, I guess, functions and you're combining them into one actual real function. Um, and these ellipses allow you to continue on to the next line. So I'm going to do one more segment. Um, so this is 2x dot multiplied by x greater than or equal to 1 and less than 2. OK. 
Okay, cool, no error messages. So let me first plot this, and I guess I'll explain a little bit more about what's what's really happening here. Um, I might not even plot because I haven't defined um, certain values. Yeah. So that as well. Uh, conversion double hung function. Okay. All this. Yeah. So obviously this doesn't look correct yet because we haven't written those conditions in. But you can see the beginning of the graph over here um, looks like what he's trying to get at here. So you have this flat area over here, um, then it jumps up to 1. Our scale is a bit different, so keep that in mind as well. This goes from 0 to 4, this goes from uh, 0 to 10, but you can see this vertical jump over at 0, and then this sloping upward part from 0 to 1. Um, so you can enter in more conditions, and it'll eventually look exactly like his, especially if you use the scale. But again, what is what is really happening here? Um, you have values that are going in. These x values are going to the function. Um, and basically what you have over here, the conditions are functioning as switches. So they will either be zeros or ones. So if they're zeros, uh, they'll turn off each of these individual lines and you'll only get feedback from one of these lines um, and that's really how the function is piecewise because you're only turning on one piece at a time you can't have something that's uh, less than zero and greater than five because that's impossible for an x value to take on two values um, so only one of these lines is ever turned on at the same time so if this is turned on this would be a one um, the rest of these would be zeros. So the only contribution to the function you get is from this line. So if you understand that, um, the piecewise functions are really easy to do, especially because the syntax is always going to be the same. So if you do more practice problems, it's still going to be um, just make the function handle, um, group each of the left-hand arguments in parentheses, dot multiply them by the conditional, um, and just add them all up. So even if you don't understand really the logic behind what's happening, it doesn't it doesn't change that much. Um, so yeah, that's about it for for week seven. There's not anything too bad. But once you start getting to I guess for loops and stuff, you'll you'll start combining all this together, and it'll get a bit more difficult. But I guess uh, good luck with the recitation problems for now.